My name is David Marr, and I'm the chair of the Board of the Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to welcome you all to today's State of the City. Uh, it is al also my pleasure to present today the, the, the Board Directors and Partners here to this afternoon's program. It's also my pleasure to introduce the MC today, Mr. Joe Michaud. He will serve today as the Master of Ceremonies, so with a round of applause, I'd like to welcome Joe. Thanks, Dave. We were talking earlier, and I said, you know, we're, we're leading off for the mayor, and they're going to say, yeah, you remember the guy that spoke before the mayor? You know, the bald guy, right? So I think it could be a little bit confusing there, but I'll try to be a little better than Neil Patrick Harris was at the Oscars, because I think we saw some of that disaster, um, although it did rival my presentation last year. That's when they asked me if I was going to MC again this year. I said, wow, this mayor really is a gambler having me up there again, huh? No pun intended. Anyways, good afternoon. It's great to see so many uh, people here today in attendance for the Mayor's State of the City Address. It's very important uh, that we listen to what the Mayor's got to tell us about what the State of the City Address and what direction he thinks that we're going to be heading in. But before we get started with that, I would ask everybody if you could please rise as we salute our nation's flag. Now to sing our national anthem, I would like to introduce Vote Tech student, um, Mayor Dan Deno. Mary Dandeno, please. Dandeno. Okay, Mary Dandeno. You know, Dandeno, I should know how to say, right? Thank you. Okay, yep. We'll grab our microphone and we'll be ready to go. Very good job, Ms. Dandino. Thank you very much. Before we be seated, I'd also ask if we could remain standing just for a moment uh, of silence for, uh, out of uh, respect and courtesy for those of our soldiers and uh, service members that are currently stationed overseas protecting us today. Thank you. Please take your seats. Okay, before we get started, I'd like to point out that we have uh, significant media coverage of this event today. Uh, stations WJFD and WBSM are here and will be broadcasting uh, the Mayor's Address live. Um, and that's uh, important to get the word out to, to everybody that's listening today. New Bedford Cable Access TV uh, is also present and they will be recording and airing this program uh, several times during the week. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to, uh, if, we, if we don't you know, scare you away today, you can watch it all again to probably tonight. In addition, the South Coast Media Group and the Standard Times are here and they'll be covering this address as well uh, and providing, I'm sure, some great uh, uh, commentary and editorial, um, you know, uh, 
assessments of uh, the mayor's address. Uh, so thank you all to the media partners that are here today for their participation in covering this important event. Uh, we need to take a moment here as well to recognize a few of the elected officials that have joined us here today. Uh, please give us a wave as, as I announce your name. Uh, representing our legislative delegation, we have uh, Congressman William Keating is here, I'm told. No, he's not here. Oh, okay, he's not. He's represented here today by his office. Uh, Representative Antonio Cabral is here. Tony. And Representative Robert Cassera is with us as well. From the City Council, we have uh, Joe Lopes, Jim Oliveira, Linda Morad, Kerry Winterson, Dana Ribeiro, Naomi Carney, Deborah Coelho, Dave Alves, Brian Gomes, and last but not least, our good friend Steve Martin. Uh, from the school committee, Bruce Oliveira and Josh Amaral are joining us today. Very important. And the uh, New Bedford Board of Assessors, Mary Pina, or Maria Pina Rocher is with us here as well. So thank you very much for coming. And I apologize if we missed anybody. We try to keep the, the list as up, but we do have people that come in at the last minute. Um, I'd also like to take a time to, to thank our primary corporate sponsor for today's State of the City Address, and that's Webster Bank. Uh, they've been consistent in their support of today's program, and, and their support reflects their dedication and commitment to the City of New Bedford. Uh, thank you. We certainly appreciate your support, Webster Bank. And I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge and thank the many supporting sponsors of this event. So special thanks go out to Bay Coast Bank, Bristol County Savings Bank, the Buttonwood Park Zoo, New Bedford Credit Union, Sylvia Group Insurance, and Veolia Water. All of those have contributed to this event today as well. As most of you are probably aware, a major event like this requires the significant support of many professionals to make it a success. So I'd like to recognize a few others for their involvement today. Uh, thanks go out to Dave LeBeau and Mike Almond of Lightworks Production for providing the sound today. Right here. Greater New Bedford Volk Tech for hosting us this afternoon. I know Linda Enos is here. Thank you, Superintendent Enos. Every time I come here, I'm so impressed by this place and, and the students. It just never ceases to amaze me. They do such an outstanding job here. Uh, the National Honor Society students and the culinary students uh, from the Voc Tech uh, that have also assisted in this event, I think some of them are here in the room as well, so thank you. <laughs> Peter DeWalt and Reynolds DeWalt Company for printing the invitations and getting all of the other stuff printed up that we needed to put this on, so thank you, Peter. Hawthorne Florist for those beautiful centerpieces that we have and adorning our tables, which are a very nice touch. Yeah. Century House today for catering today's delicious meal, which was pretty good. I thought the chicken was excellent. Chase Canopy for donating uh, chairs, tables, uh, and decorations um, that we're all sitting in and, and enjoying today. So Chase Canopy as well. It's gonna be, I get to the end of this thing, they want me to read the phone book here or something. <laughs> Special thanks to the mayor's office for helping to coordinate this event today and, and uh, all of the assistance that they provided as well. Uh, he's a hardworking staff and we can always count on them to support us in these endeavors. And of course, our keynote speaker, the Honorable John Mitchell, the mayor of the city of New Bedford, to taking time out of, of his uh, schedule to update us up on what's going on with the city and what the, what the current state of uh, things are as well. So, Your Honor, thank you for coming. And they never put this in here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Special thanks to the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, staff. Uh, as most of you know, uh, they're currently leaderless and rudderless with Roy being gone. Not really, but we have Dave Maher has done a great job stepping in. But they have really done a fantastic job. Our people that are working on the staff at the Chamber, uh, in addition to putting this event together, taking care of all of the myriad of other duties that uh, they are uh, responsible for. So if I could get a round of applause for the staff at the Chamber. 
really do a good job. It is now my pleasure to stop speaking so you can listen to somebody else. But I'd like to introduce uh, the regional president of Webster Bank, uh, Mr. Bob Toomey, who's going to uh, basically give us a, a brief assessment of uh, what's happening with Webster and Company. So, Mr. Toomey. Thank you, Joe, for your kind remarks. On behalf of Webster Bank, we are thrilled to be able to sponsor the State of the City Luncheon for our sixth consecutive year. Webster is celebrating its 80th birthday this year. Our CEO, Jim Smith's dad, founded the bank back in 1935 in Little Waterbury, Connecticut, and our headquarters remain there 80 years later. In all those 80 years, we've only had two CEOs. I'm also celebrating my 10th anniversary with Webster Bank this year, and I've been so proud to be associated with this fine institution. I've had banking relationships in this community for almost 40 years. New Bedford and the South Coast region are so important to Webster. Our bankers have been part of the fabric of this community for many years, and several of them are here with us today. Carlos de Cunha, Senior Vice President of Commercial Banking, is a trustee of the UMass Dartmouth Foundation, a commissioner of the New Bedford State Airport, a past president of the Prince Henry Society, a member of the New Bedford CEO Group. He's been with Webster since 2009 and has been a leader in the greater New Bedford banking community since the late 80s. Jeff Paliuka, Senior Vice President, Business Banking, is a member of the Chamber's Board of Directors and Vice Chair of Membership. Jeff's been with Webster since 2010 and has been serving this community for 16 years. Linda DeMarco, Senior Vice President and Market Manager for our Community Bank, is on the Board of Junior Achievement of Southern Mass and the Fall River and New Bedford Samaritans. Linda's been with Webster for 27 years, serving the greater New Bedford and South Coast region. Don Trapoli, Senior Vice President, five years with Webster. He runs business banking for all of Rhode Island and Southeastern Mass. Don is active with the Fall River Chamber and the Narrow Center for the Arts in Fall River. All of the Webster people here today and those working at our local banking centers are deeply devoted to serving the needs of this community. In the 12 months since I last stood on this stage, we've closed more than 50 million in loans to a variety of local businesses and 24 million in residential mortgages, of which 15 million went to first-time home buyers. We've also held more than a half dozen seminars for first-time home buyers in this market, including one with the City of New Bedford Housing and Development that attracted more than 50 attendees. And we rolled out a very successful series of free workshops for senior citizens on how to detect and prevent elder financial abuse. We offer these seminars to senior centers and other organizations that serve our elder population. Linda DeMarco leads this effort for us in the South Coast. And in fact, she taught one this morning at Oaks Nursing Home and Rehabilitation Center to an audience of almost 40 people. Since beginning these workshops in late 2013, we have held a half dozen in the greater New Bedford area alone and reach more than 200 local senior citizens. I'm honored that the Chamber has asked us to again participate in today's State of the City Address. Webster Bank is privileged to be part of this vibrant community and to have a strong working relationship with the City of New Bedford. Two of our clients from the City are seated at our table, Mark Fuller, Assistant Treasurer, and Carol Day is Operations Manager. Now in his second term as Mayor, John Mitchell continues to press forward on a range of issues that matter most to those who live and work in New Bedford and the surrounding communities. From the start, his approach to governing New Bedford has been to confront every challenge head on and to seize each opportunity with energy and optimism. Mayor Mitchell's leadership strategy builds on the unique assets of New Bedford, assets so many other American cities can only dream of, including a dynamic and industrial and recreational port, a growing downtown business district, a vibrant cultural scene, an amazing history and a proud population with a strong sense of community. Mayor Mitchell and his team have been working diligently to address what really matters to city residents, restoring confidence in the school system, operating a more efficient and effective city government, improving the quality of life in city neighborhoods, and encouraging economic investment and job growth. So today we look forward to his report on where the city stands and to hear his vision for its future. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, please join me in welcoming New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell to deliver his fourth State of the City Address. This is becoming a habit. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you, Bob, for that warm introduction. And thank you to, uh, to Joe and Dave and the Chamber for another great job in organizing this terrific uh, event, uh, to Webster Bank for its sponsorship and all the sponsors uh, today. Uh, and thank you to Superintendent Linda Enos and Vogue Tech for uh, their customary hospitality and the exceptional food. Joe is right, the chicken was really good. Um, it's really easy to see why Vogue Tech is shining today on so many fronts. Um, elected officials, residents, and friends of New Bedford, uh, I'm going to begin my remarks today uh, by welcoming my wife, Annie, who is here with us today. <laughs> She didn't know I was going to do this. Um, I'm the second busiest person in my house, and it's been uh, a while since uh, she and I had lunch together. So uh, we relish this opportunity for a little time together, and, and it's even better that we have 500 of our friends join us. Uh, in a year uh, that we will remember most for snowdrifts, uh, the residents of our city have hung together, strived on, believed in better, and worked for it. I'm here today to report that the collective effort of our residents and city employees has produced real and unqualified successes. Let's take stock of it for a moment. We have experienced robust across the board economic growth in this city. Our major businesses, especially our manufacturers, have generated a rising tide of job creation. Joseph Abood, for instance, alone has added over 200 jobs in the last year. But it's also been the new businesses like the Black Whale and DMB Burger and the, and the new business incubators in and around the downtown that mark a surge in entrepreneurial activity that is expanding our economy from the ground up. The growth has been less, dra less dramatic than if it had resulted from one major project. Home runs are great but singles and doubles add up too. And they've really added up. One of the more accurate measures, uh, reliable measures of municipal growth, the number of building permits issued is up 40% since 2011. But it's really about the jobs. Since 2011, according to the Massachusetts Department of Labor, the labor force in New Bedford has grown enormously, adding over 5,000 jobs. That is a staggering number for a city of 100,000, regardless of its history, and especially an older industrial city. The growth in employment has been so rapid that last July, the Wall Street Journal reported that of all U.S. cities, New Bedford experienced the sharpest drop in unemployment over the previous year. We are in the midst, in the midst of a job expansion <laughs> We are in the midst of a job expansion that this city has not seen in decades. These are indeed impressive statistics. But what's far more important is that it has meant more people taking home paychecks to support their families. Uh, and that's not the only progress that we've seen in the city in the last year. Uh, we are steadily chipping away at crime. The overall crime rate has fallen 2% since the previous year, thanks in large part to our high-performing police department under the leadership of David Preventure. School reform. <laughs> school reform is moving forward on all fronts. And a school system which three years ago was on the brink of state takeover, uh, I, I am pleased to report now that thanks to the, to the efforts of Pia Durkin and our hardworking teachers, the four-year graduation rate is at its highest level in the last 15 years. <laughs> City services have been upgraded across the board through the continued implementation of performance me management systems and our adherence to the New Bedford Way. The statement of our city government's commitment to high quality services that I announced last year right here. The most conspicuous of these improvements in the last year were the overhaul of New Bedford's trash collection system, which has resulted in the dramatic doubling of the city's recycling rate and a reduction of trash on our streets, as well as the replacement of our old street lights with energy saving LED bulbs, both measures that will save New Bedford taxpayers tens of millions of dollars over the next 20 years. 
Our solar program that uses city-owned properties for solar farms has garnered national attention, including, again, in the Wall Street Journal, which reported uh, since we were here last that the city of New Bedford now derives more electricity from solar per capita than any U.S. city except Honolulu. Now, I would submit that Honolulu has not ever had the winter that we just had, so it's not exactly a level playing field. The point is that our proactive efforts in green energy will save taxpayers over $20 million in the next 20 years. And the last, thank you. In the last 18 months, we have built three brand new public parks, Custom House Square, Rivers End Park, and the Allen Haskell Public Gardens, all unique, all big additions to their neighborhoods. Last year, I promised that we would plant 500 trees a year for the next five years. We exceeded that goal in year one. We're going to do it again this year. Those trees will slow down traffic, clean our air, raise our property values, and make New Bedford a more beautiful city still. And over the last year, we embraced our city's rich heritage. We showed that New Bedford is serious about historic preservation when we became one of the first, one of the only cities, one of the few cities in Massachusetts to pass the Community Preservation Act. We threw the best and most reverent veterans parades the city has seen in a generation. We celebrated the 100 Feast of the Blessed Sacrament together, the best ethnic festival in America. And when the Charles W. Morgan made her homecoming to our shores last summer, drawing the largest crowd of tourists to downtown in decades, New Bedford put on a welcoming party that made our residents swell with pride for our glorious past and showed America that New Bedford is back on its way up. These and too many other successes to list are all very real results. They are real wins, and they didn't happen by luck. They happened because we rejected the fatalism that says that because New Bedford, like other older industrial cities, had experienced persistent decline over many decades, that decline somehow is inevitable, that it's all preordained. No, we believed in better, and we worked for it, and we continue to work for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that our work is done or that our challenges have all been wiped away. There's still too many people out of work and too many absentee landlords wreaking havoc in our neighborhoods, making them all less safe. We still have a ways to go in our schools and our finances are as tight as ever. But in the last three years, we've proven that we have the right approach. Our way is not to sit back. It is not to passively hope for the best. We haven't waited for others to do something for us. We have initiated the action. We have stood up for ourselves and we have chosen to be the authors of our own story. It is a story of how a mid-sized American city pursued a vision of itself and was willing to make the tough, long-term decisions to, uh, to realize that vision. It is a vision of a city that is the commercial and cultural hub of southeastern Massachusetts, a city that is taken seriously beyond the region, a city with a diverse economy that creates high-paying jobs for its residents to build homes and send their kids to college. A city whose schools are a primary reason why families move into the city. A city with a highly professional, caring, and efficient city government that commands the confidence of taxpayers. And a city in which personal safety is only an afterthought. And where all city residents take responsibility for their neighbors and their neighborhoods. From our economic development efforts to, our, to school reform, to stewardship of our neighborhoods, to the management of our city finances, we are making the long the long-term hard decisions so that we can write our story on our own terms. In the area of economic development, my administration is focused on creating the conditions for sustainable job growth. More good jobs means more residents purchasing homes, more kids going to college, more money being spent in local businesses, and a more confident community. The success we have had in creating the right conditions for job growth in the short term, in the current last few years, is encouraging. But sustaining growth in the long term, which we must do, requires careful, careful planning, a vision, and unity among community leadership. That is why in my State of the City speech here last year, I called for the formation of a committee of business and nonprofit leaders to answer more or less the following question. What will it take to regenerate Greater New Bedford's economy 
sustainably in the long run. The city needed a definitive economic development strategy and who better to formulate that strategy than the region's business leadership and many of you are here today. I wish now to thank the committee members and its chairman Jerry Cavanaugh for their months of hard and thoughtful work along with Derek Santos and the team at the, at the Economic Development Council that produced a plan which will guide our economic development efforts in the years ahead. When state or federal officials or outside investors ask, does New Bedford have a plan, we can all answer, yes we do, and a very good one at that. The plan is based on a few key ideas. The first is that it is a plan, uh, a regional economic development plan, a regional plan that is New Bedford centric. The city is the hub of a culturally, economically, and physically distinct metropolitan area. We may not be a major metropolitan area, but we are a metropolitan area nonetheless. We're not just one, New Bedford isn't just one of a series of communities that string along the southern coastline of Massachusetts. We are the center of it. New Bedford, and particularly the downtown, is the gravitational center of the region. We all recognize that. Many, if not most of you in this room, live in the community surrounding New Bedford. But you're here today concerning yourself with the state of the city of New Bedford because New Bedford is your city. You recognize that as New Bedford goes, so goes every nearby community. As our, own, as, as our own metropolitan economy, our focus should not be on how greater Boston, the greater Boston economy might benefit us on how, or on how, um, but we need to focus instead on our own strengths, our own assets. This plan does that. Chief among our assets, of course, is our port. The key to making the most out of the port of New Bedford and to enable our maritime businesses to create well-paying jobs is to recognize that our port can and should continue to support the success of all of its industries. Commercial fishing, of course, but cargo as well, as well as recreational boating. Opportunities lie ahead in each of these industries. And the long-term strength and stability of the port lies in having a dynamic and diverse set of business activity. Our strategy should be to stick with the historic approach of uh, making our harbor available to businesses that can gain a competitive advantage by operating there. Rather than favoring one industry to the exclusion of others, our choice should be all of the above. I am pleased to report uh, another successful year in the port of New Bedford. We, of course, remain the preeminent commercial fishing port in America, and although the total catch in the Northeast continues to shrink, our slice of the pie is growing. According to the most recent NOAA data, New Bedford's landings now comprise 34% of all of New England's and 9% of the entire country. Uh, we are, to use the metaphor, the biggest fish in the sea. I will continue my fight to level the regulatory playing field uh, for the industry, not just at the Fisheries Council meetings, which we've been to time and again, but also on Capitol Hill, where this year Congress will take up reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the, the legislation that governs commercial fishing throughout the United States. At the same time, we've worked closely with Maritime International, our harbor stevedoring company, around the expansion of cargo in our harbor. And this year has been a real success story. This season, we had a record number of freighters call on the port and have doubled the amount of tonnage uh, that has come in. Every one of the port calls, those, every one of those large freighters that we've seen in the harbor injects uh, about a quarter of a million dollars into the local economy. And those, that creates job opportunities for our longshoremen. Uh, they've seen more business than they have in recent memory. It also bears noting that the recreational boating sector, which draws millions of dollars into the port, and we're not known for this, but we, it is a big business in our harbor, is growing too. Last year, we started a launch service uh, on uh, the HDC, the Harbor Development Commission started a launch service to bring boaters who are moored in the harbor into uh, the central waterfront so that uh, people could leave and walk into the downtown and spend money in our shops and restaurants. Um, in its first year, the, the launch carried over 1,300, uh, 1300 riders and mooring rentals in our harbor uh, nearly tripled. People are coming down to the harbor also, as we all know, in droves to hear the concerts, to go to the festivals. They want to connect with the water. The completion of the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal in the months ahead 
will offer more opportunities for cargo vessels and other maritime jobs. With the expansion of the Panama Canal in the coming years and the establishment of large cargo hubs on the East Coast, there will be opportunities for ports of our size to serve as redistribution spokes for those hubs. The new terminal sets us up very well for that business and gives us yet another opportunity to create jobs in the port. The terminal will also help us become the premier offshore wind port in the Northeast. Windmills may not appear in our harbor as quickly as we would have liked, but the opportunity to become the center of the offshore wind industry in the United States remains well within our reach, and we must be ready for it. Consider this. Off the coast of Northern Europe, there are now some 65 utility scale wind farms that are lighting homes from Germany to Great Britain. With some of the best winds on the planet just south of Martha's Vineyard, not too far from here, and with a growing demand for electricity in the Northeast, it's just a matter of time before those European developers come to the United States and come to this part of the United States. We might not see Cape Wind, but just around the corner is, deep, is the Deepwater Wind Project off of Block Island. Major European players in the industry are also staking the, their claim to the federal waters off of Martha's Vineyard right now. They are coming and they will find a very reliable partner in the city of New Bedford. The next important step in uh, our quest to become a center for the offshore wind industry is about to come up. And that is for the legislature to pass a bill that provides reasonable market incentives for the industry. These incentives, if coupled with an expansion of the natural gas supply to the state, will help diversify our energy resources and stabilize prices without, at the same time, unduly burdening ratepayers. The city, along with Representative Tony Cabral and our legislative delegation, are supporting the legislation proposed by Representative Pat Haddad that would do just that. I urge the business community, many, so many of the business leaders in the region are here today, to get behind this bill if we are to have a more stable energy policy in the state that enables the offshore wind industry to set up shop right here in New Bedford and to grow jobs throughout the region. To capture all the opportunities that lie ahead, the Port of New Bedford must continue down the road of modernization. We will continue to advocate vigorously for capital investment in the port. To be competitive, we need to upgrade our port facilities, dredge the harbor, and replace that old bridge so that we can open it up, open up the northern part of the harbor to more commerce and more job creation. As our growth continues, we must hold ourselves out as the serious port that we are. This is very important. As it stands now, there are only two general purpose industrial ports in Massachusetts, Boston and New Bedford. That's it. Uh, any major American ports generally are governed by port authorities, governmental bodies that promote the development of maritime industries whose powers vary from place to place. It's time that we raise the profile of our port and begin referring to our harbor management organization in the same way as other ports do. So I will ask our legislative delegation to amend the enabling, the enabling act of the Harbor Development Commission to create and define as the management authority the New Bedford Port Authority. That will be the name of our governing body. A name change alone will go far uh, to reflect appropriately just how far the port has come and the promise that it holds for tomorrow. The downtown, of course, is another great economic asset here in the city. It is the urban core of the region, the center of our economy and cultural life, the first place we take friends visiting from other places, and the primary place of common experience in our region. Downtown is the label on the New Bedford product. We continue to invest in the downtown because we know that there is no successful city in America, none that lacks a vibrant downtown. It just doesn't work that way. The center has to hold up all the rest of it. It is why we continue in the downtown to plant trees, improve the landscaping, and put up signs like the Pier 3 sign and the Port of New Bedford sign that celebrate our heritage. It is why we put down more cobblestones and bricks and organize summer concerts on the water and promote public art. And it is why when building public spaces like Custom House Square or refurbishing the Zyterian, we set and, and expect high design standards. To attract investment, the place has to look good and feel great. And the residents of the city, and this is the most important point, deserve no less. It's all, the downtown belongs to everybody in the city, whether you live in the north end or the south end or the west end. It's yours. I want families to be able to walk to the downtown 
and taken a show at the Z and dine at one of our restaurants and spent a moment in a great public space that makes them proud to be residents of the city of New Bedford. As we've been making these public investments in the downtown, we've seen private investment interest pick up. The new stores and restaurants that have set up shop in the last few years have lowered the downtown vacancy rate to under 10%. The spectacular addition uh, to the Whaling Museum, headed by James Russell, now underway, is itself a validation of the growth in the downtown and the city more generally. Looking ahead, for the downtown to realize its full potential, a few things have to happen. And these are all things that are spelled out in the regeneration report. And these are things that we've talked about as a community over the years. The first is that, the first thing that needs to happen is that more people need to live in the downtown. And the reason is pretty simple. The more people walking along downtown sidewalks, the more people will venture into downtown businesses. For businesses to thrive in a dense urban environment where strip mall style parking isn't available, Pedestrian circulation must be robust, and that is why we're working with developers to look for opportunities to build residential development in the downtown so we have a real urban neighborhood. Second, the downtown must become unlandlocked. Yes, I just invented that word, unlandlocked. We've got a great downtown and a great harbor, and although we have taken significant steps to knit the two together, they're not fully connected right now. A downtown that extends to the state pier, as called for in the Regeneration Committee report, will make our downtown really something special. Being an industrial port doesn't mean that the public must be cut off completely from the waterfront, uh, as is the case right now, more or less. Virtually every major industrial port in this country finds ways to connect people to the water. Just think about Baltimore and the Inner Harbor, a big industrial port that has, that has great places along the water for people. Um, this is hardly a radical uh, idea, and I think we can do the same thing here without imposing on, our, on, on the commercial fishing industry or any of our other maritime industries. Third, and this may be the most important thing, in the years ahead, expansion of higher education in the city, and particularly in the downtown, is a must. Universities are driving the American economy right now. They are the sources of research that spur innovation, they are the economic hubs in their communities, and they attract educated professionals. The success of cities like Boston and other major uh, metros that are growing like gangbusters these days can be explained in part by the role universities and other research institutions play in their regional economies. And it's not just big cities. Take Worcester or Portland or New London, all mid-sized New England cities that are enjoying growth around their universities. The best example may be Lowell where investments by the University of Massachusetts are rapidly modernizing that city's traditional manufacturing economy. New Bedford and Lowell are often cited as New England cities that are on the upswing. But the part of the story that must be told is that while the UMass system has made a whopping $600 million in new capital investment in Lowell since 2009, during that same period, the university system, the UMass system, has not spent a dollar and capital investments in the city of New Bedford. Any serious discussion of economic development in the city has to come to terms with this fact. New Bedford is one of the few urban centers in America. And by urban center, I mean a city that is not a satellite of a major metropolitan area. One of the few urban centers in America without a university headquartered in the city limits. In order for us to compete effectively in the global economy, and retain education, educated professionals in the city, this has to change. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we import a, new, a university from somewhere and plunk it right down in the city of New Bedford. That's not what I'm talking about. The place, obviously, to turn is UMass, which has programs, though not large ones, already here. We need UMass to be a partner in the city's resurgence and grow its physical presence here for the good of the city and, frankly, the good of the university. There have been encouraging signs of late, however. Chancellor Davina Grossman has worked with the city to kickstart the long-stalled SMAST expansion in the South End, and now that project has traction. UMass Dartmouth is now actively looking for opportunities in the downtown as well. And the university is supporting some of the new technology incubators that are setting up in and around the downtown right now. This is just a start. 
and there's a long way to go, but the effort is moving in the right direction and it needs to be accelerated. So we have a sound economic development plan that we are relentlessly implementing, which is based on what the city does well. So, one might ask, why roll the dice on a casino? Are we going all in on a business without a track record in Massachusetts when we should be doubling down on our maritime uh, and manufacturing sectors? Or by pursuing a casino, are we wisely hedging our bets on these industries? After all, this is all a high stakes decision. Come on. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, I'm going to quit my day job. <clears throat> so you have heard me say that for the last couple of years that I would be willing to enter into a, an agreement with a casino developer only if it were a good deal for New Bedford. Whereas in other communities, municipal leaders have said more or less, just tell me where to sign. I believed that any deal would have to be done on our terms. The deal we fought for and struck with KG Urban is a good deal for New Bedford. It is on New Bedford's terms. The direct benefits are hard to deny. The project will create over 2,000 permanent jobs, that conservative estimates are. That would make it twice as large as the Akushnik Company, the current largest for-profit employer in the region. The direct annual payments to the city would enable us to stabilize our finances and reinvest in the city. The project would clean up a massive brownfield site that will otherwise remain as is for the foreseeable future, perhaps for decades. It would spend, and the project would spend year in and year out considerably on New Bedford businesses. Now, some might point out that other casino projects have made similar claims, and we all know that casino developers, ha developers have often failed to deliver on their vaunted promises up front. So why is this different? I shared the concerns voiced by many that a casino might diminish the appeal of the downtown, the availability of waterfront industrial land, and tarnish the city's image. So I fought for terms that directly address these issues. The agreement, the host community agreement, limits the number of shops and restaurants and hotel rooms, so casino patrons are going to be forced into the downtown to spend money. They'll have no choice. Uh, they're not going to want to wait for two hours to get a seat at, at a restaurant at a casino, um, at, at the casino site. We insisted on a conference center, uh, and, we, and we were able to secure one in the agreement that will hold some 2,000 people, not all of whom at any given event are, are going to be gambling. Uh, these are people, there will be people in every, in every group who will gamble and others who will want to see things like the Whaling Museum and the Zyterian and go to our, uh, our shops and restaurants and other cultural attractions. It brings more density to the downtown. Uh, we've protected the Zyterian. We've created a voucher program to encourage tourist spending uh, in, the, in the downtown and throughout the city that the casino will have to, they have to issue. And we've required the operator to procure a minimum of $10 million a year from, uh, of goods and services from New Bedford businesses. That will create a multiplier effect uh, throughout our economy. We made sure the harbor bulkhead is put to good use. This wasn't something that casinos would be generally interested in, but I am. Um, and so what we did was we created new space for commercial fishing vessels. We've seen what our docks look like. They're stacked three and four deep of fishing vessels. We need room. We made sure we created some room on this site. Uh, and to the extent that it couldn't be used for commercial fishing vessels, we created a marina, and that marina is going to generate income for our Harbor Development Commission, which sorely needs it. Perhaps as importantly, the site will not scream casino. I insisted on a number of limitations on the project that will make it fit into the urban fabric of New Bedford. We required the developer to scale down the buildings. They came in initially at 24 stories and dropped it to 17, and I insisted they go further, and they went down to 11 stories, which would hardly be the tallest building in the city, not even close. It won't stick out like a sore thumb. The buildings will reflect, uh, and, we're, and we're, not, uh, we're not putting signs, they're not putting signs on the tops of these buildings. There's a, sign, there's a height restriction on signs, so the first thing you see when you're, down, when you're driving downtown or standing nearby is not casino or the name of the operator or some logo. It's brick, you're going to see brick buildings. The buildings will also reflect the same design elements of the downtown and with brick facades 
and pedestrian lighting and other uh, historic elements. We have also forbidden casino billboards in the city. We don't want our city to look like a casino town and because of the protections that I insisted on in the host community agreement, it won't. Having fought for and secured an agreement on New Bedford's terms, my job now is to support KG Urban's effort to secure a license from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. If KG is successful, my job will be to help this development fit into our community's future. What's important for us to think about, even now, with still a long way to go, well before any license is issued, is that uh, while this project represents a unique opportunity for the city, we should not regard the project as the goose that laid the golden egg. We have been disciplined in how we spend the, the public's money. That's why we've been able to do more with less in recent years and achieve the, the highest bond rating in the city's history. The annual payments from the casino should not be viewed as an opportunity to loosen up the purse strings and to start spending like drunken sailors. This money needs to be reinvested wisely to further our existing economic development agenda and stabilize the city's long-term finances. The priorities are all spelled out explicitly. These priorities are all spelled out in the host community agreement because we insisted on it. It has to, that has to, we have to set now a set of expectations around how money would be spent by this casino if we're lucky enough to get that license. In this vein, the casino should not be seen as an end in itself, but as another means to create opportunities for our residents. That is what this city, this very American city, has always been about. We are a place where the American dream has been realized over and over again. This is a city where people have made the most of the chances they've been given. My grandfather came to this country, to this city, with a third grade education. He came here to fish, and I never had the chance to meet him, but I can safely assume that he never imagined his grandson would become the city's mayor. What is striking about this story is that it isn't unusual at all in the city of New Bedford. Despite all the reasons that others have come to doubt New Bedford, it has remained a place where people have come to find work, whether it be on the water or in a factory or somewhere else, in the hope of giving themselves and their children a chance to reach and maybe even exceed their dreams. What gets me out of bed in the morning is the knowledge that it is possible through the work of the administration I lead to help open up opportunities for our residents. Everyone should get a chance. It is this ideal that motivates me to expand opportunities through economic development work. It is why I've encouraged local hiring throughout my tenure and fought for the strongest possible local hiring requirements in the host community agreement uh, with KG Urban. And that is why today, I am proud to announce a set of principles for public and private investment in the city called New Bedford Works. These principles will be rolled out in the weeks ahead, but the basic idea is a set of mutual commitments by the city and anyone w wishing to invest here concerning the hiring of city residents and contracting with city businesses. The expectation is simple and reasonable. If you are doing business in New Bedford, you should give our people and our businesses a chance to compete. That's not too much to ask. And at a time when major investments like the casino, the harbor cleanup, and other projects uh, are, could, that are or could be coming uh, online, we need to establish an understanding of what obligations are owed in this community. I wish to thank the entire team that is working hard to finalize this policy, including Matt Morrissey, Buddy Andrade, Gus Santos, George Hempe, and many others. We can't make employers hire local residents and contract with local businesses. We can't force them to do that. But we can certainly expect them to understand that our residents and businesses are ready to pounce on opportunities when they are granted them. Our work to expand opportunity extends to our children, of course, our school children. And at this point, we need no reminding that our schools had been in a state of decline for several years and had reached the brink of state takeover when I entered office. At the time, many suggested that we simply let the state take over and wash our hands of the problem. We chose the hard work of leading our own reform, knowing that it came with the risk of responsibility. We would own it. That was the right decision then, as the work is now moving ahead in earnest and the results are starting to show. 
I mentioned the past only to highlight that it was through the persistent focus on the New Bedford school system by the Standard Times under the leadership of Bob Unger that the magnitude of the challenge and the need to address it head on became clear. Bob elevated the issue of education reform because he knew that our region couldn't pull itself, uh, couldn't pull itself forward if its children lacked the skills to compete in a global economy. Bob, of course, has moved on from the paper, but the reform effort has long left the station and isn't stopping. Bob, thank you for setting the bar higher for our schools. That's exactly where it should be. <clears throat> so reform is proceeding under the tireless leadership of Dr. Peter Durkin, and there is nothing easy about that work. Change is hard but it is necessary. Turning around any organization of some 2,000 employees takes time, especially when they, they have under their care some 13,000 students. The entire enterprise that is the New Bedford School Department is undergoing, undergoing a dramatic overhaul. You name it, and it is changing. From the organizational structure, to personnel and recruitment practices, to finances, to busing, to special education services, to the school schedule, to the curriculum, to information technology systems, and instructional practices in every classroom. It's all being made over. Our teachers are shouldering the load, and the public needs to know that they are working really hard right now, and they deserve, they deserve a round of applause. Now some of this effort, some of this effort is already showing up on the scoreboards we tend to focus on. MCAS scores are inching forward. Uh, many more students, a record number of students in New Bedford High School are taking advanced placement courses. A number of them are seated right over uh, along that curtain right over there. Uh, and as I noted, the dropout rate, uh, and this is very significant, uh, has dropped significantly. And that's a huge achievement by our school system. No one, um, no, and the pro all this progress will become more evident as time goes on. But no one should be under the illusion that this is all an overnight exercise. The direction of reform in our schools is the right one, but it won't be fully successful in the absence of trust. Change can be threatening. People become defensive when threatened, they stop listening, they turn inward, and make effective teamwork less achievable. As we move forward, let us all remind ourselves, all of us, elected officials, business leaders, school administrators, teachers, parents, and members of the community, and anybody who cares about New Bedford, that we all have the same goal, to build a school system that provides our children with the tools they need to flourish as adults. We might not agree on precisely the same next step all the time, but we need to communicate and listen to one another. We'll be surprised at how much more we can get accomplished together. We've moved mountains in our school system already. Let's finish what we've started for our kids. <laughs> strong cities have strong neighborhoods. And neighborhoods remain strong when residents and City Hall work together to support a quality of life that allows children to play outside and dogs to be walked and homeowners to sit on the porch on a warm summer's night. Vibrant neighborhoods draw residents out of their homes to comfortably spend time with their neighbors in a way that strengthens the bonds, uh, those bonds with their neighbors and makes for stronger communities. While most of our neighborhoods fit this ideal, and uh, not all of them do, although the city has been successful in keeping the lid on gun violence and crime overall is down 2%, I believe there is more work to be done. We will continue to hire new police officers and upgrade police equipment and vehicles. We will continue to refine our analysis of crime data in ways that will enable us to anticipate trouble and put police in positions uh, to deal with it ahead of time. We will continue to address the blight that attracts criminal behavior. We will continue to race graffiti across the city and clean up vacant lots. Our neighborhood task force will continue its aggressive enforcement of the building and sanitary code in our house so that our housing stock can be safer and neater and our neighborhoods look better. Tonight the City Council has an opportunity to, uh, to pass the problem, problem, problem Property Ordinance, the most important crime prevention measure that has come before the Council in recent memory. This measure, which I filed over two years ago, would shift the cost of excessive police responses to landlords who ignore, ignore problems on their very own properties. 
We have some properties in the city in recent years, and far too many of them, where the police have been summoned more than 100 times, over 100 times within a year. We know that landlords can't control everything that the tenants do, but at some point, landlords who turn a blind eye to persistent problems of people they know are themselves bringing problems to the property um, bear some measure of responsibility for those problems. I thank and applaud the seven city councilors that voted the measure out of committee on Tuesday, and I asked uh, them, uh, and I asked for your support for them tonight. So let's get this done because it is a big deal for our city to stabilize our neighborhoods in ways that will enable them to turn the corner. The biggest challenge to our progress, uh, as it is for many cities these days, is to find the money to address our needs. Since the financial meltdown of 2008, government at all levels is still struggling to pay the bills. We are still navigating through dangerous financial currents with no safe harbor on the horizon. And that's not news. You've heard similar things from me before. The days of property, healthy, property tax, uh, healthy property tax revenue growth are not in sight. And the precise level of state aid is uncertain. Meanwhile, the cost of government is going up. And we're still dealing with budget decisions that have, uh, made, uh, have been made in the past that put us in a difficult position. Again, this is not news. What is news is that these conditions persist despite the efficiencies we've been able to implement in the last few years. City government right now is leaner and more efficient than it has ever been before. Wall Street gave us the highest bond rating in the city's history because of our sound financial management and operational management. We have been nationally recognized for our municipal solar program and energy efficiency measures that is saving the city millions of dollars, as I noted earlier. And we've saved millions more by restructuring our debt, managing a conservative capital improvement program, and switching our phones over to voice over internet so that, uh, so that we can reduce our phone bills. In the last few months, we shaved off a quarter of our retiree health care liability, which will save an enormous sum, $138 million over the next 30 years. That's a huge achievement. Uh, they have produced, all of these things have produced enormous savings, yet we're still looking at structural challenges in our budget. And so we will continue down the path of more transparency, more efficiency. We may have picked the low-hanging fruit, we're going to pick the higher fruit to make our city government more efficient. Uh, but we still have to face up to the fact that the costs attributable to retiree benefits whose terms and eligibility are dictated by the state are continuing to become a tighter and tighter vice. Another big chunk is the decline, uh, chunk of the problem is the decline in state charter school reimbursements. Again, these are state decisions that are putting the pressure on municipalities, including us. We are going also, we're also going to be faced on how to pick up the salaries of many of our firefighters coming off the federal SAFER grant when it expires later this year. We have applied for a new grant to fund a lower number of positions in the hope of avoiding layoffs in that department. And we're working very closely with the fire department a very effective fire department that keeps us safe to accomplish just that. What all of this means for the city is that we're going to have to trim back this year. And I've instructed department heads that we need that we need to find savings and we need to, to expect that we're not going to be level funded this year. We're going to be funded at lower levels. And so we can expect re spending reductions and none of that will be easy. But these are the tough decisions that are necessary to maintain the steady course that we're on. Until we see more growth in property values, we must maintain a disciplined approach to financial management. And that's exactly what we planned to do. Writing the story of our city's future, of the future to which we aspire, in the face of these financial challenges is a, is a tall order. It's hard. But nothing in life that is worthwhile is easy. We take on these challenges to make our community a better place because if that isn't a cause worthy of our devotion, what is? This is our home. Uh, this is the home of our family. This is the home of our friends. Our community is a big part of us. Writing our own story means that we get the opportunity to divine, define ourselves not by our challenges, but how we respond to them. For all that who profess a love for our city, we need to ask ourselves what role we can play in that story. How can we contribute to the long-term success of our community? The answers are all around us. It's people like 
David Lima, who has stepped forward to lead a community dialogue on teen suicide and, thank God, has given teenagers in dire need in this city the confidence to talk about their problems. It's people like Reverend Russ Chamberlain, who found a way to keep his shelter doors open and put a roof over the heads of those who were left out in the brutal winter that we're emerging from right now. Uh, it's the city plow drivers who strained to stay awake over days of pushing snow out of the way so that public safety vehicles and residents could get up and down our streets safely. Uh, none of these people are going through the motions. None of them are doing what they do and doing the little extra to, gather, to gain attention or adulation. They don't do it for credit. They, along with the many others, have put themselves out, out there, not for, for any kind of reward at all, but simply to make our community a stronger place. They've paid it forward. We all love New Bedford, but love requires action. If we care about education, if you care about education, find a way to help a student, even tutor a student. If you care about the look of the city, volunteer for Operation Clean Sweep or a garden club, or just pick up trash when you have a free moment. If you want to advance important civic goals, serve on a board or simply speak out about them. Engage with the community. There are many ways to serve, but what matters most is that we extend ourselves just a little bit, just a little bit, each one of us. Our bonds of friendship and our community uh, and, uh, between ourselves and our community will cement themselves. We will become a stronger people. We will be able to achieve all of our goals. And together, we will leave the great city of New Bedford a better place. Thank you, and God bless the city of New Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was very good. We enjoyed listening to you. Thank you all for coming on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Chamber. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors once again for helping to make this event happen. And uh, that concludes our uh, event for this afternoon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day at work, I guess. Thank you.